So welcome to Data Modeling for Experts with Power BI. And actually for this session only, this is a unique, unique opportunity for you. We upgraded this session to make it even harder and more horrible. So it's now called the Brain Melt Edition. <laughs> I warn you here, here be monsters. You'll see stuff that will hopefully, if we do our job right, will melt your brain. And if not, guess what? My brain is already molten, so at least somebody's brain is getting molten. So anyway, we're going to talk about the weird, the crazy, the aggravating, the honestly annoying pieces of data modeling for Power BI um, for experts. So bear with us for a pretty interesting ride. I think we get start, started pretty mellow, right? We start relatively easy, but towards the end, it will ramp up into nightmarish complexity that will just make you cry and want to scratch your eyes out. So are we ready for that? Yes? Cool. Awesome. Let's get going. So I'm Jeroen Teheert. I'm a senior product manager or program manager. That's my previous title, whatever, at Microsoft. I own DAX and modeling in the Power BI team. So anything about the programming language that you all love to hate is my work. So please be gentle on me. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's basically me. Yep. And my name is Mark. I'm working as a solution architect data analytics at McCall, a Dutch Microsoft partner. Um, working there for five years now, but mostly busy with everything Power BI. Um, and I'm also a four-year in a row awarded uh, Microsoft Most Valuable Professional. Yes, so and we keep doing these kind of sessions because data modeling, honestly, is maybe the less known and also the most important part of actually working with Power BI. So let's get started about that. Um, so what will you learn about after the session? You'll be able to successfully, finally, implement calculation groups and know what you should take into account. You'll be able to build and optimize composite models. You'll be able to combine direct query and import storage modes in a single data model. And then you'll be also be know a little bit about how to do query performance optimization in complex situations. So as you can see, there's loads of interesting words here, loads of complexity. So we should just dive in. Um, so what are we talking about just to level set all of us? We're talking about um, the, the steps that we call model, right? So when you build a Power BI report, of course, everybody wants just to load some data, visualize. But we all know that's only like 5% of the actual work, right? There's like loads of times you spend in the two intermediate steps, clean, and then model. And if you skip, skip over the step, you'll be building your house, your report, on the foundation of quicksand. And nobody wants to live on quicksand, right? You need to spend time doing this foundation properly. It's not the most interesting work. I love to make pretty pictures, but if you skip this, you will not have a good maintainable, usable, and performant report. So if you ever are pressured to skip over this step, don't do that. Just take time to clean and model your data before you start making pretty pictures. So we assume kind of a couple of things here, because guess what? This is a session for experts. So you have loads of things that we won't cover, which is also good to level set us, right? We all expect that you know that you should actually use a star schema in Power BI, right? If you come up to us and say, hey, I've got issues with, your flat, with my flat model, we'll just tell you to go home, right? You built the wrong model. You need a star schema. We won't cover the different data model types. We won't cover modeling best practices like naming. We won't cover all the time relationship, direction, relationship. We'll cover loads of things. We won't cover loads of things that are all on this slide. We, between us, we think this is like intermediate slash beginner level stuff. From this foundation onwards, we're going to build. OK? So I don't expect you to be an expert in all of this. There might be terms on this slide. You go like, I don't know what that's about. That's OK. Just saying we won't cover all of this. We expect you to come into this session with some kind of knowledge. So then, talking about knowledge, this is going to be our data model for the session. Very straightforward. Um, Star schema, in this case, um, could also be a snowflake. But basically, your one fact table, multiple dimension table, star schema. There is a role-playing dimension right. Does this work? Ooh, it works. Uh, right here, right? You see a role-playing dimension. You see, hopefully, a loads of one to many. Ooh, we actually have a bidirectional. <laughs> OK, so actually, that's basically two fact tables. I actually now noticed. I didn't know that, but OK, that's fine. Just sales, some dimensions, and another fact table. OK, so that's what we're going to use in our demos. You don't need to keep this in mind, just so you know when we say order and sales, you kind of know that they are related, and product as well. OK, so are we ready to do this thing? 
Um, I am am, because <laughs> I want to get this over with. But just, you know, get ready to do this. Okay, so we start easy. We'll just slowly ease you into this. So let's go over to Mark to talk about storage modes. Yes. So storage modes is one, one of the important aspects in Power BI. How do you connect your data actually to Power BI? And in which storage mode do you do this? So first, what is a storage mode? Basically, in Power BI, we can work with three different storage modes. It's either import or direct query, and the third one is dual, where dual is actually a mix of both. Depending on the query uh, uh, setup, it might end up in a dual mode. So basically, in the model view of Power BI, you can directly identify which storage mode is being used. By default, we'll say import everything unless, unless there's a good reason to do something differently. If you look at, at the, the slide right here, we see the internet sales table, which is aggregated, so the left bottom one, um, that one is the imported table. If you look at the internet sales or the product table, they have the blue line on top, the solid line. That one is the direct query table. And then we have the product subcategory, and product subcategory is on dual mode. Depending on the query, as I already mentioned, it might work differently. So if we start visualizing something based on the product subcategory and the total sales amount, we will end up with imported data. So we'll use the product subcategory in import mode as well as the internet sales aggregate. As soon as we start combining something with the uh, product table and then the sales amount, then it will behave in direct query mode. Basically because it uses a different query context. Storage modes are configured on table level, so for each table individually you can define it, and the storage mode is basically, if you set it once to import, you can never go back to direct query, uh, unless you delete the table and start over. And you don't want to do that. Nope. No. Um, another thing to keep in mind, if you have something on direct query, you cannot visualize it in the, or, or view it in the data tab in the Power BI desktop, so that's also a way to, to yeah, identify the direct query table. So, as I already mentioned, in the model view, you can see basically how this thing behaves, and depending on the relationship that we're crossing, it either acts in import or in direct query mode. So the product category is in this case, if we take that data, or the product subcategory, um, then we'll, we'll have everything in import mode, otherwise it will behave in direct query mode. There are a few benefits to mixed storage modes, actually. Simply because you can optimize the query performance here. As soon as you aggregate your data up to subcategory or product category level, you will benefit from faster performance if you visualize something with the internet sales table. But as soon as you drill down to individual product level, you might start using direct query. And you don't have to import all that data into your data model. By doing this, you basically make your data model much smaller and perform faster while you still have the availability to go to all these nitty gritty details if your user really wants to. Another reason to, uh, um, to use direct query could be near real-time requirements, for example, with hybrid tables where only a certain partition is on direct query. And as it already mentioned, large data sets, so you can choose to not import all your data but put specific items on direct query. There's, uh, there are a few risks that come into play as well. So if you don't refresh your data model, if you don't refresh that imported data, it might be out of sync. So as soon as you work with import and direct query in, your, in the same data model, be aware that as soon as the user drills down to, into the direct query table, he might see a different result where the, the sum of that or the average of that might be different than what you've seen on import. So here's your dear user using your report and he's clicking on a button and suddenly all the results change, right? I mean, yeah, they're yeah. probably getting confused at this point. So this is very important to make sure your data keeps in sync. Yes. Regularly refresh that imported data. So the query context here is the important one, and the query context is what we'll set on table level, and in this example we used uh, uh, only the aggregated data, and this is in user, an example of a user-defined aggregation. So the internet sales aggregation is what by default will be hit by the query, unless we drill down to those specifics, and it will use the direct query table. So let's jump into some composite models. We talk about composite models as basically mixing these storage modes together. Mm -hmm. And the storage modes is basically the, uh, uh, the direct query or import that we co combine in this case. Um, but it also comes down to, for example, creating a connection to an existing Power BI data set. 
And composite models is basically everything that combines two different direct query sources or import in direct query. This is everything to do with, uh, um, and I always forget this word, so you have to help me remember, source group, right? Yes, yes. source group. So every, all, all imported data is in the same source group, but every direct query data source has its own source group. Yes. And a composite model basically means that we combine source groups, not necessarily the storage mode. So yep. two direct query sources from different data sources is already a composite model. Because it results in two source groups, right? Yes. But if you have three imports and one direct query connection, you still have two source groups. Yes. Right? Weird. OK, good. <laughs> First little quirk. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. There are a few things that we also have to keep in mind in this case when we work with composite models, and that is typically um, the different storage modes that we just talked about, but also many-to-many -many relationships, and that m might also lead into limited relationships. Ooh, limited as, relationships. As soon as you cross a, a relationship from an import to a direct query table, it will be a limited relationship. So a limited relationship is not you being in a friend zone. It's different. <laughs> Sorry, I had to make that joke. That's too bad. <laughs> Basically, a limited relationship means there will be an inner join performed between both tables, where by default, tables will perform an outer join over the relationship. I think we've all ever seen that blank row, so imagine you have a dimension with five product categories, but you have way more data in your fact table. And you get that, that blank row which sums up the rest that, that cannot be matched towards one of these product categories. That's only happening with a regular relationship. Yeah, so if you have a limited relationship, that blank row will not be there. Um, we called it weak relationships before, but then design and marketing said that's not a term we want to use for Microsoft products, so let's find something else. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just being very honest and transparent here because that's the conversation that I had. So we came up with limited. So if you, depending on your source, if you go online somewhere in the community, you might still find people talking about weak relationships, exactly the same thing, just so you know if you're looking at any blogs or whatever that have been a little bit older. Um, I think the, the good people from SQL BI have actually been so kind to just do a find and replace on weak and replace it with limited because I asked them to. Um, so yeah, just so you know, if you look at weak, it's the same as limited. So in this example, you see the limited relationships actually. And the limited relationship is defined by the open ends on each end of the relationship. And we'll see that right here. Yep. For example, if we cross the relationship from product category to the target table, Although it isn't one too many, it is a limited relationship, just because of the two different storage modes. Well, the different source groups we're in. Source groups. Yes, True not that. storage modes. <laughs> yeah, it's already confusing me. Yeah, it's okay. Um, we're only getting worse from here. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, Sorry, I'm off track. <laughs> You'll see that actually every relationship flowing from uh, across different source groups um, will be a limited one, and as soon as we have a relationship between two direct query tables, so internet sales to date or uh, uh, dates to calendar year, that's just the regular relationship again, as yes. we used to be uh, to be working with. Yep. So limited relationships. Let's talk about that a little bit more, right? So normally, um, you have regular relationships. Um, so there's a couple of cases in which you can end up in a limited relationship, but all of them have to do with the fact that on the one side, so where the little one is showing. Um, on the relationship, we don't know what's happening actually in the product. We have no idea. And that might be because you're crossing source groups. So when you're crossing source groups, the relationship that walks across the boundary is allowed to enter the country on the other side, basically, if you think about countries and boundaries, but it's not allowed to, for example, from outside, know anything about what's actually happening inside of the country, right? So it has to walk over and then can finally peek in. So that's why we don't know what's happening on the other side of the relationship. As a result, cross-source group relationships will always be limited. And then, so that's one. Um, so that's cross-source group. Again, doesn't mean you, you, you cross, um, you mix storage modes. It basically means I have two direct query sources or one direct query and an, uh, and an import, and then I'm actually in uh, two source groups, so that means I'll always have a limited relationship. Um, it can be a cross storage mode, but doesn't have to be, as I just explained. The other type that you might have is many to manys, which obviously you shouldn't have, really. I mean, if you end up in your model being loads of many to manys, I don't know what you feel about it, but honestly, if I see people having many to manys all over the data model, I go like, you just didn't do 
proper data modeling if you just do that again, right? So that should not be the case. By the way, there's an interesting bug in our product that sometimes we might actually show you the cross-source group relationship with these little broken open things that Mark just showed, and sometimes just for the fun of it, we might not. So <laughs> be on your toes, right? Be on your guard here. There's two situations in which you can get a limited, it's many to many, and crossing source groups. Sometimes the product might tell you, sometimes the product might not, because we still have some work to do. Yes. So, so let's, do, let's do a demo. Yeah, let's jump in the first demo of today. So what we're going to do is connect it to a direct query data source, and we're going to combine it with some imported data. So basically, we're going to work with two source groups. First thing is we're just going to connect to a SQL database. And to not rely on internet connection, we're going to do that just locally. So your <laughs> next demo will already fill, so you already know that. Because you don't have an internet connection. Yes. That's great. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to work with fact internet sales, and we're going to combine that with some other tables. So let's say we also want the, where is it, the dim uh, product table. Let's also do the product category, subcategory, and somewhere a dim date. Um, normally, you, of course, go, first go into transform data. You might fix some column names and whatever you want to do. And in this case, I'm just directly going to connect. And as you'll see here, the first time that you connect to a source that accepts direct query, typically every source that accepts uh, a, a queries from Power BI being sent, you got to choose wh which storage mode you want to combine or, or use. Um, mm. In this case, I'm going to choose for direct query. Isn't this very confusing? Like, we also have live connect collection mode, right? We have direct query import on live. Why the heck do we in this message say live? It just trips me off every single time. Anyway, sorry. Well, you're the only one that can fix it. Yes, I am. Uh, I should. <laughs> I should, but I won't. Because <laughs> then I don't have the session anymore. <laughs> so as soon as we're connected here, we'll see that we don't have the data tab because we only work with directory right now. So we only have this diagram view. In, our, in this relational data source, we already have the, some relationships, so the relationships are directly imported, otherwise we should have created them right here. Um, in this case, we have everything connected, but we're going to combine it with a second data source, and that is our target data that we have and maintain in a nice Excel sheet, because we does not love that. No. So, so at this moment, you imported five tables, right? Or you did diary query, whatever you clicked, I didn't, wasn't really paying attention. Oh, it's diary query. So you have five tables, but they ends up in one source group. Right? Important to remember. Just one source group, five tables. So next we're going to import our targets. And that's on product category level. So we're just going to load this data in as well. And now Ooh. a warning will show. And this is an important one. Because basically what is happening here is that data from uh, uh, one table might be sent to the other table while we're combining this data in the same query. So as soon as I start visualizing our actual sales with our target data, it might be that the target data is sent over the connection in a where clause or whatever to the uh, direct query data source. Um, it is a security risk. Usually, if you're familiar with this, you probably just click OK and you continue, because who can actually see this? Probably your database administrator. Yeah. If they look at query traces, they might see this data coming through. We'll get to that a little bit more detail what this message means, right? In yes, just a sec, I think. We'll do. Yeah. Okay. So next thing is we're gonna build that new relationship. And this will become a limited relationship. Because the limited relationship basically means we're gonna cross source group. Yep. Or storage mode. Or source group. Or storage mode. Or source group. So here we go. <laughs> it's just a one to many relationship. It is a single dire direction, but no nothing identifies us here that it will be a limited relationship. So as soon as we click OK. There we go. We, we have that relationship with the two open ends. Yes. So we now know it's a limited relationship. Yes. Great. This is basically the, the basics where you will start seeing that it is a limited relationship. And as soon as we start using this, that an inner join will be performed. Yes. And it's important to note because you then don't get the empty rows. And if I had a dollar for all the customers that open support tickets because they don't get empty rows, I wouldn't be working at Microsoft anymore. So here we go. We have some product category names, and there are four. As soon as we open uh, the target table and we attach the targets to it, we'll see that only three are left. And now that new fancy thing suggests me to come up with another data visualization, but I just want to have a table. 
You need to go to the, the other thing. The other thing? Come on, it's so easy. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's very intuitive. So here you will see that actually the inner join is performed right now because you have only three categories left. Mm -hmm. and that you could have formatted this better, but okay, fine. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> it's it okay. was not about visualizations, right, this session? Yeah, sure. Cool. So that's composite models, and I guess we have another demo plan that's going to fail, so we're just going to spend a little bit more on this. Okay, so we just saw a couple of cool things here. We saw limited relationships in action. We talked about at length what you, what you, what you should know about it. Um, and then we saw this guy. Um, so when you read that, you might go like, what the hell was happening here? There's a learn more link that will bring you to the best documentation ever written. <laughs> but it's, I'm proud of it, um, because it will hope, try to explain what is, what's happening here. So basically what happens here is the moment you do make a connection to more than one source, um, there's nothing wrong at this point. We're just warning you, because we don't want to get sued, that you might be exposing data. At this point, there's no data being exposed, there's no data being shared between two sources, nothing is happening. It will all depend on how you're going to use these two sources. We're telling you now, so at least you know that if you do that and that happens, we told you. Okay? So if you leave the two sources alone, it's fine. There's no data being shared. However, what Mark just did, he made a relationship between the two things. Right? And when that happens, and then when he visualized that, the unique identifiers of the one side of the relationship are going to flow over to the other side of the relationship. And then, since that was a cross-source group relationship, that actually means that the unique identifiers from the targets table are going to flow over to whatever it was on the other side. Category? Category, yep. I think. Right? So that means, or it's probably going to be the reverse, but basically it means that whoever is looking at your queries on the side that is getting queried will see data they're not supposed to see, because they're seeing unique identifiers from an other source that might, for all we know, and that's why we're showing you this, might, for all we know, be a completely different company. Right? And we're telling you, hey, you're combining stuff, we're not stopping you, you're combining stuff, but depending on what you're going to do from here, you might be exposing data from one company to the other. Are you sure you want to do that? The other way to get into this situation where you're actually exposing data is to not use a relationship, but just write a measure. You could technically write a measure that defines this relationship not inside of just you dragging and dropping and adding the relationship, but just inside of the measure. The same exact thing will happen. You will see unique data from one source flowing to the other. That's the only thing that we can do because we have to make the join. So an administrator on any side of the source can see this depending of his permissions, of course, and encryption settings uh, you should also take into account. So when you see this warning, be careful. Um, we're just telling you because in case you wanted to sue us, we can just say, we told you so. OK, so composite models. Great. Composite models are awesome. Why wouldn't you use them all the time? Well, there's some performance issues here. right? There's mo very important performance uh, uh, metrics that you will have to measure when it comes to diary query performance. We all know diary query is awesome, but you don't use diary query all the time because diary query is slower. right? If you want the best performance in Power BI, go import. right? Aggregate your data and import it. That's the best way of getting performance. Diary query will always be um, will slower than import. Um, so you will need to cross sources depending on how you use it, which basically will means that data needs to be retrieved from the source where Mark is standing. It will need to be sent over this way, be processed, and then sent back to wherever your machine is, maybe somewhere in the middle on the planet. That will take time. So all of these things with different storage modes, diary query coming into play, Query execution from one source to the other with unique keys flowing from here to there will just basically hurt your performance. By the way, if you do this, um, something we don't have on the slides, but um, if you do a cross-source group relationship, especially when you do it across um, to a Power BI data set, you need to leave the number of keys under 50,000. So the unique values on the one side of the relationships, let's say the number of unique customers you have compared to the fact table with sales that is over in a Power BI data set, we will get to in just a second, needs to be under 50,000. If it's above 50,000, if it's 50,001, you call Microsoft support, will not help you. No, I'm joking. But 50,000 is a good golden rule of keeping your performance up to snuff. Um, did you want to add anything here? Anything I skipped? I don't think so. No. Cool. So I already mentioned something called composite models on Power BI datasets. 
and analysis services, which is a feature that I own, which has the longest feature name in the history of Microsoft called Dire Query for Power BI Datasets and Azure Analysis Services, or now known as Dire Query for Power BI Datasets and Analysis Services, because we also support analysis service on premises. <sighs> and very soon to be renamed to composite models. <laughs> Um, this is in preview. It has been in preview for two and a half years. Way too long, if you ask me, but okay, fine. Somebody should do something about it. Um, and it basically allows you to build a composite model, as Mark just did, but then not on just a random SQL server, no, on a Power BI data set. And before, you couldn't do that. Before, when you connected to a Power BI data set, that was it. You had a live connection. You weren't able to make this into a direct query connection so you could add more data. How did we ever live without this? I don't know, but once you know it, once you have it, you go like, why hasn't this always been here? Where have you been all my life? So that's basically what we do. We allow you to connect to AS, so analysis services on premises or in the cloud, Azure analysis services, and, and or Power BI data set, and then mix and match. Add an Excel sheet, add a CSV, add one more data set, add another, whatever you want to do. However, keep it to mind, there's a couple of goals and non-goals that we had with this feature. Um, so I've seen people doing loads of interesting things with this feature. So I just wanted to take some time to explain what we thought you should be doing. Um, so the first thing we had in mind is you extending your data set. So think about your data set as a big circle. That's your central data set. It's stored in Power BI or in AS, and you're connecting to it. Life is great. And then you notice that suddenly that targets table is missing. Hmm, it would be great if you could add it. Well, that's an extension. The target table is assumed to be less big than the bigger circle. So you add a smaller circle. And maybe you add a couple more smaller circles. And that's what we have in mind when we say extend. You're taking a central data source, the big um, uh, Power BI data set, or another service source, and you add a couple smaller circles. That's extend. Uh, the other scenario is enrich, in which you don't add any data. You actually add something useful, like a measure that might be missing, right? Or um, my go-to example here is changing a format string, because nobody in their right mind would write a date with the month first, right? Well, I live in the US. <sighs> OK, so anyway, so imagine somebody creating a Power BI data set in the US. For them, they format month, day, year, right? Then you're here in Europe, you go like, that doesn't make any sense. My customers don't understand any of this. Well, luckily, you can now use a composite model on that data set to just change that thing, just change the format string of all your dates to what actually makes sense is day, month, year, right? As we all agreed, and as everybody with any brains would actually, no, just, um, anyway. So that's enrich. You're not adding any data. You're just changing something to make it more useful to you. So that's the other thing. The third one is overview. And overview actually means we will allow you to show multiple Power BI data sets next to each other, multiple AS models even, um, without you connecting them. And that last sentence is very important because we didn't have the intention for you to combine two or more Power BI data sets together. The product will not stop you from doing that. But your performance and your customer experience, your user experience might vary, right? So we will not stop you from doing that. I actually have looked at telemetry. I have seen somebody that combined 55 data sources in one composite model. The product won't stop you, but it, you know, come on, that's not what we designed this for. The real design here is you take one data set and you go like, ah, oh, there's something missing. I want to change that format string, or I want to add that measure, or I need to add that data. That's what we designed this for, not for you to just combine the whole world into one big data model. That's not what we had in mind. It will work. It might not perform, but we won't tell you. We won't, we won't stop you, actively stop you from doing that. So that's one thing. The other thing is, Think about um, the cross-source group relationships. For example, if you have a fact table with sales on one side and orders on that side in a different source group, so different source, you build a relationship between the two, you very quickly end up in the situation that we just talked about, is that the 50,000 unique customers will have to flow to where Mark is standing, which will just take forever. So your queries will be very, very, very slow. So in that case, you should just consider moving that customer out of that source into where Mark is standing, so then, it is not a cross-source group relationship anymore. All the optimizations that DAX and Power BI does will kick in, and then it will be way faster. Just keep that in mind when working with this feature. It's an awesome feature, but um, it has a little bit of a couple of quirks. Um, we're skipping this, right? No, let's just try. I think we can just quickly connect. I'm just trying to fill the time because you told me that we didn't have an internet connection. We're just going to try it. Okay.
Let's see. So the other composite model situations is where uh, Jeroen J just talked about working with uh, Power BI data sets. Yes. Um, and then still combining that target sheet. Um, in order to do this, we're going to open up a new Power BI desktop instance. Yep. And we do have an internet connection now. So we're going to move to a new Power BI desktop instance. And connecting to a Power BI data set is as simple as just going to the data hub, click Power BI data set. And if it is with us, then in a being, second we will see. Being patient is yes. a big part of that. Uh, we'll see basically all the data sets that, that I've access to based on the account that I'm using here on the right top. Yes. Um, I have to sneak a little bit because I have to see what the name was, something sales model. I think so. And I can directly connect to this and not the one in my workspace. Right, but another one to call out. Don't do this on my workspace, it won't work. Yep. Just so you know. It's written in the documentation, but who reads documentation? <laughs> I spent so much time crafting documentation for all of you, and you still refuse to read it. <laughs> no, that's not true. I know loads of you read it, but I do get a lot of questions like, it's literally there. No. Anyway. Frustrations, sorry. <laughs> right now, we're just connected live. This is what we call live connection. Yes. We only connect to an existing data set, that's it. Um, as soon as we start adding that Excel sheet to it, we'll see this, this message appearing. Yes. It is asking us whether uh, it, if we allow it to change uh, to the, uh, the, the model to a remote model, uh, meaning the live connection will convert into a direct query connection. Right. Um, if we click on add local model, that means that we convert it into a local data model that runs in Power BI Desktop at this point and we have a remote model living in a Power BI service which we connect to over Direct Query. So pay attention here, remote and local will become very important in the next section. Yes. Also we will see this dialogue appearing where we can select which tables we want. Ooh. So remember the, what Jay just told us, you can also make a sub-selection to make smaller data models or smaller se sets of it. Uh, and you can just also decide to include all tables that might be added in the future. And you can even, if you go to the top, if you have a perspective enabled, you can also use a perspective. People wanting to use perspectives. And then the fun thing comes you in, go. you cannot build perspectives in Power BI, data, no, uh, in Power BI Desktop. Whatever. You still need to have an editor. Yes? When we read that connection there, mm -hmm. can you go back and like, include other tables? Yes, you can do that. You can, oh, so, you select everything. Yes. So your question is, if you just was in this UI, you selected only two of the 10, maybe, can you come back to that UI to then say, oh, I forgot whatever other tables. Yes, you can. You can go into data for settings, and you can say edit data source, and then it will pop exactly the same UI after some thinking. We'll show you the tables, and you can then select those tables, and those will be added. In fact, if you have the reverse, where you selected too many, you can do exactly the same to get rid of them, or you can just delete them for your model once you connect it, right? If, let's say you selected all 10 and then you figured out, no, I only need five, you can go back into that UI again, deselect them or just remove them from your model, which would not remove them from the source, right? It will still be there in the remote somewhere, but it would just remove them from your local model. Yeah? Yep. Is there a way to set new across? We'll get to all of that in the next section. Hold that question. <laughs> So again, like we just did in a previous demo, we can now connect to the Excel sheet, add that Excel sheet, and basically the rest is the, sa the same. We again get the security warning, we click OK, we don't read it. Um, <laughs> and right here you will see that data tab appearing again. I love it, that's why I love presenting with Mark, <laughs> with the sage stuff like that. <laughs> it's awesome. Anyway. Well, who, who likes to read such long dialogue text? No, no that, that's why you put it in there, because you, you're going to click it away, and then we told you so. so exactly. It's fine. So yes. right here, we have that other uh, table again. We can just connect the relationship. And remember, this, again, will be a limited relationship. Well, let's because see if we actually sh Oh, we show it now. Good. <laughs> Not always. Sometimes. Well, you can also see that as soon as you move it like this, you cannot really spot it anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. okay. So, um, as part of your demo, are you going to add a measure? Yeah, we can do that. What measure do you want me to build? Uh, targets versus my sales. So basically, well, how far am I in versus my target? Sure, let's do that. So let's first create a measure for the total sales. And let's zoom this in a little bit so you can all read it. So 
So sales is sum of sales amounts. Great. Uh, you named it already. You, you already ah, have one. Crap. Okay, sales demo. <laughs> <laughs> never, n never, <laughs> never do this. Never name your measures demo. Shh, <laughs> don't say it. <laughs> so we're going to do the same for the target. So we have target is sum of target. Yep, great. And now we want to do some kind of like A difference between the two. So or whatever you want to do, it doesn't matter. It's just to answer your question, can you actually do this? Well, we'll see. <laughs> can uh, you? What, what would be easier in sales? Ah, crap. UI is crap, yeah, Jay, fix it. Oh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Get a move on. Come on. Minus targets. And if we shouldn't talk about best practice, but I'm still going to do it. No. Please get rid of yes. uh, the table names because you don't need them. And we can just drag and drop this in. We can visualize the differences. Oh, and it doesn't work. Good. Okay. What did fine. you do? I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> oh, I think your internet connection just dropped. Yeah. Nice. So the answer is yes, you can. Because what he just tried to do is connecting to a Power BI data set and an import data set in from the targets, then wrote a measure across them, and that will just work perfectly, with some exceptions. But in this case, the exception is not that the product doesn't do it, it's just internet connection issues. Uh, it should technically just work. But if you have measures already in the model that you have there you go. Experience yes. That one, but it doesn't have any knowledge of what you have. Right, so you can just refer to that measure and use it as is, and we'll actually get to that question in just a second. The next section, I saw there's a, a question about performance difference between live and direct query. If you switch from direct query mode to live, uh, sorry, from live to direct query mode, does it have inherent performance um, downsides? If you don't do anything else, the answer is no, not really. But my question would be, if you don't want to make any changes to the local model, why create a local model in the first place? Just leave it in life, right? I mean, why make it more, your life more complicated than what it needs to be? Yes. Go back to the slides, I guess? Yep. Cool. Okay, so now we get to the next step, which is calculation groups. So we're slowly building complexity. We're almost there. We're halfway to the top, three quarters maybe. And this is where yes. I kind of zone out. No, just joking, but. <laughs> well, first comment, you cannot build calculation groups in Power BI Desktop? Not yet. Okay, okay. Um, calculation groups, what, what exactly is it? Calculation groups is basically a way to reduce the number of redundant measures. We all know and, and love the year-to-date, date, dates, month-to-date, all that sort of stuff, but we build that on top of our targets, on top of our uh, number of orders, on top of our, uh, the sales amount, as we just did. We keep repeating the same logic. Yep. In order to avoid this, you can build a calculation group. Yes. You define this logic in one place, and you can reuse and apply this logic on all your measures that you have in your model. The typical example is also the uh, time intelligence, so year-to-date, month-to-date, quarter-to-date, but the alternative could also be to change format strings. For example, changing from zero decimals to two to whatever, or visualize it in a different way if you like. Um, today, <laughs> calculation groups can only be created with external tools, like Tableau Editor. Um, oh, you actually added that note. I didn't I see did. it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, stay tuned. I mean, we don't have a date to announce, but it's, it's fair to say, and we're allowed to say that we are act actively working on uh, calculation group authoring in Power BI Desktop. So this is where I expect you to all applaud uh, and stand up and cheer. Thank you. <laughs> oh, and, and by the way, all the other things as well. Perspectives, you know, whatever you have that is hidden, hidden inside of this engine that we built for you, and then on top of that, we slapped a car that actually doesn't use all the features. We're going to close that gap, and that's going to happen very, very soon. The code is being written or has been written already. So that's coming to you very, very soon. So that's exciting. Yeah. So other limitations will be object level security is not possible on top of a calculation group. So you cannot actively say, OK, that user is allowed to do these two options. The other user can see four or whatever. Um, smart narratives as a visual are not supported with calculation groups. Yes. Um, and little spoiler for what's going to come and will be the, especially the brain melting part, <laughs> be aware of potential unexpected behavior of calculation groups as soon as you combine them with composite models. Yes, yeah, so here we should just basically have written beware of monsters because this yes. is where it's hiding. 
So how does it work? There are four DAX expressions that typically work and are related to calculation groups, being selected measure, selected measure name, is selected measure, and selected measure name format string. <laughs> um, you should have made a very shorter version for that. Typically, on the right-hand side, you will see the example as we build it now today. We have the uh, uh, sum of sales amount, and then we add the logic and the calculate, like date, month to day, dim date. With a um, calculation group, we convert that into calculate selected measure, whatever the selected measure is, and convert that and then and apply it on top of every measure we drag and drop in it. So I will not gonna, because of time, not gonna create it from scratch, yep. um, but I will just jump into the one that we already prepared. So right here we have a calculation group built and we already did that with general editor. I'm Dutch, so I like the free version rather than the paid version, but okay. <laughs> um, what we have right here, a calculation group will appear as just another table in your model, and uh, you can add it as a slicer to your page. Um, and right here, I got the sales measure, and let me quickly change that into a card visual, which is slightly easier to see. So we have 29 million now, and as soon as I click something like month to date, and uh, let's say for the year 2019, um, it will automatically make that just one million. If I change the quarter to date, it will be four million. Um, and so it dynamically applies this, this context that we have in the calculation group on top of the measure we have. Because this measure that we have right here is nothing more and nothing less than just the sum of sales amounts. There's yes. no additional logic to it in this measure right here. They're pretty magical. The calc groups are. Yep. So we have nine more minutes, come on. <laughs> let's jump back to the brain melting part because yes, we don't do want that. to skip that. Okay, so who knows about wholesale versus non-wholesale? Who has ever heard about that? Cool. I'm no, gonna nobody of you watches uh, the SQL BI videos? No. Well, apparently not. Maybe not. I don't know. So I'm going to melt all of your brains because we're going to talk about this stuff because you should know it. Um, so non-wholesale versus wholesale. So first, let's talk about remote versus local. Remote basically means I connect it to a Power BI data set somewhere or an analysis services model. That's over where Mark lives. I live over here. So that, by definition, is remote from me. If I have a direct, connection, direct query connection to that model, it's still remote, but I also have a local model which points to that. If you are a programmer by trade, you might think about it as a pointer, something that actually doesn't contain anything. It's just a layer on top of whatever Mark has uh, in his thing. So that's a local model versus remote. That's the thing you should know. There's also remote measures over there. Remote measures have a funny thing, is that if there's a measure of definition over there, I can see the measure, but I cannot see the DAX. So I have no clue what's happening inside of that remote measure. I can still use them as we just did, but I have no idea about what's happening. And then, this is where the brain melting part starts, a calculation group in that remote model that Mark just so beautifully defined might or might not be applied to my local measures that I might define. So I have a local thing. I can actually define a measure here that might use the data from Mark or not, or my own data, or a mixture of both. Depending on what I do here, the calculation group that Mark defined over there might be applied or not. Right, so, okay, so wholesale. So wholesale versus non-wholesale. Wholesale basically means if I write a DAX expression, a calculation group, or a measure, if that thing is dependent on just objects, tables, relationships, measures, in the remote model, that thing is called wholesale. Um, anything else is non-wholesale. So anything that depends on two remote models is non-wholesale. Anything that depends on objects from remote plus local is non-wholesale. So only if you have just dependencies on things that Mark has that I don't, that I want to write a measure for, I am wholesale. Otherwise, I'm not. Uh, calculated columns on a table from a remote source group that you define, so I define a calculated column on my local table that points to the remote table that Mark has, must be wholesale, otherwise you'll get an error because we simply don't allow that to happen. And then non-wholesale is everything else. Okay, so now we get to the <laughs> monster part. We should in insert a, a monster slide here. But okay, so what happens if my measure location is remote or local, if my measure is wholesaleable, yes or no, so it's wholesale, yes or no, then a remote calculation group might be applied or not. So this is the, the part that will probably trip you up multiple times, so I would, I would try to remember this. So if I have a measure location that Mark defined in his remote model, it doesn't matter if that's wholesaleable or not, but let's say it's wholesaleable, it only depends on exactly that 
um, that thing, in, what Mark has in his remote model in his source that I am just connecting to, if he then has a remote calculation group in the same source, that measure will be impacted by that calculation group, like he just did from actuals to year to date, that thing will change. So now if I have a local model, so I'm happily connecting to Mark's data set, I'm typing a local expression, and I'm only referring to things that Mark provided to me in his data set, my local expression will be wholesaleable, and as a result, my local thing will be impacted by the calculation group defined over there. Okay, so far so good. But now, if I create a local measure that actually tries to combine stuff that Mark provided as well as my own stuff that I just imported, I'm no longer wholesaleable. I am, because I'm crossing source groups, I'm not just dependent on the stuff that Mark provided, I'm also taking my own stuff into that measure, then I'm not wholesaleable, and then my remote calculation group will normally not impact my change. So if Mark then switches from actuals to year to date, my thing will not change. Although it's still local, still local as the same as the second thing, but you have to look at the expression to know if this is wholesaleable or not. We don't tell you anywhere. Well, let's just jump into that yes. demo and show you how, what it actually looks like. Let's do that. Um, so we have another Power BI data set prepared for you, and this is nicely a composite model. In this case, we didn't add target data, but we just had that other uh, sales data that we maintained somewhere locally. Doesn't really matter, it is somewhere locally, and again, we lost internet connection. What a good Wi-Fi connection. Job. Awesome. Um, so it is an, uh, uh, a limited relationship that we have right here. Yes. And as soon as we start combining this, we have in our remote model that we connect to that lives in the Power BI service, we have a calculation group. So okay. what's happening right here is, let me first release all these things. Ah, nice. And what's hit refresh. Happening? Oh, it just lost connection. Haha, <laughs> you need to sign in. This is going to great. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, or it works if you just click cancel. Oh, that's typical Microsoft products. No, it doesn't. Let's try again. Nice. Screw this. Um, <laughs> okay, that's going to be a great demo, because yep. it's just access. Should we just talk to it? Let's do that. Okay, we can talk to it. So basically, what we were trying to show you, I think, do we, I, I think we have it on the slides, don't we? No, we don't. Okay, great. So we skipped it. So let's go here. Okay, so if I define a local measure that says total sales, Okay, so I have total sales that takes my, what are you doing? Are you trying it again? Okay, fine, I'll just keep talking. Um, so we have total sales, and I'm gonna take a sum of, let's say, the internet sales that Mark provided, and I have my own list of reseller sales here, okay? So my reseller sales is something I imported, so it's not remote, it's Mark's, it's mine. Um, so Mark's has internet sales, I have uh, uh, reseller sales. If I do a very simple expression that says total sales is internet sales plus reseller sales, Sounds like life is good, right? Well, no, you just created an expression that's non wholesaleable because part of that expression refers to Mark's stuff, internet sales. It does internet sales when I point it to Mark, I think so. And then part of the, other, the same expression points to my stuff, reseller sales, so it's not wholesaleable. Now, Mark has this beautiful calculation group that changes actuals from year to date. So now your user going to switch from actuals to year to date, assuming that my total sales measure is gonna reflect the change from actuals to year to date in that calculation group. Well, guess what? It will, kinda. So it won't completely, because what happens is the remote calculation group is over there, it's over at Marks. So we, uh, internet sales will now happily change from actuals to, to, uh, to year to date because that's the calculation group that we switched. Um, but my local measure, my reseller sales, is local and therefore not impacted by his remote calculation group, so that will not switch from actual to year to date, it will still happily show actuals. Then I have a total sales measure that now is taking a sum of a year to date internet sales and an actual reseller sales date, and that's of course bogus, right? That's the problem that you have here, and there's no way for you to tell unless you can read DAX and you know exactly what's going on on that side uh, or on this side, this will completely hurt your users because they go like, why doesn't this number make any sense? Well, it's because wholesalable, wholesalability is on the market, it came into play, and it's just screwing up everything that you have. So there's a couple tricks that you could do, but just be mindful, the moment you do something with a composite model on a Power BI data set or an analysis services model, you have remote measures, you start combining them with your local measures and your local data, and you happen to have a calculation group, you're in heaps of trouble because this will happen to you. The good news is, all of this doesn't matter if you don't have direct query to a Power BI data set or a model, to an analysis service model. Why? 
Calculation groups, another thing. Measures, another thing. In SQL Server sources, for example. So all of this goes out of the window, you moment do that. But if you do a composite model on top of a Power BI data set or in another services model, you can have remote measures, you probably will. You might have a remote calculation group, and then you should know that depending on how you set this up, you might get into bogus situations. Now, you could technically add a local calculation group that would change that measure. So then, your user would have to change Mark's calculation group from actual to year to date, then go to yours, also change it from actual to year to date, and then his reseller sales will be updated, and then your local, your internet sales, sorry, internet sales and reseller sales will be updated, but that means your user has to click twice before they get actual good results. You could do sync slicers, but that has performance issues as well, so it's not a best thing to do, but sometimes that's the only trick you can do. So just because we're out of time and we lost some time here, um, your brain is probably melted, at least my brain is molten by now. Um, this is just hard stuff. Let's be honest, this is really hard. So be careful, here be monsters. If you start using composite models on a Power BI data set or an Azure Analysis Services model and you use a Cal group, you have remote measures, you should keep this session in mind. Be very, very careful. So consider picking the right storage modes when mixing all of these ingredients together, you should warn yourself and pinch yourself, keep on top of it. Um, and that's, I think, all we had. So if you wanted to review all of this, oh, there's some resources, great, we'll send you the slides. If you wanted to review all of this, we actually have a webinar series online that you can v visit where there's both this experts as well as medium, as well as intermediate beginner kind of stuff. There's a link here, there's five hours, four hours and a bit in which you will just hear us two rambling into your ear about all of this about data modeling. We'll melt your brain again, and you can at least review it at your own pace. So with that, thank you. Thank you so much for being here.